Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father, we just thank you for this time that we could come and worship you. And thank you for your resurrection power that is mm-hmm. confirmation that you are Lord and Savior. And we thank you that you're the first among all to be risen. Mm-hmm. And that your proof, your verification gives us the foundation that we can continue to have eternal life in you. Because mm-hmm. the opposite is eternal life without you. Mm-hmm. Father, we just thank you for dying on the cross for us and rising from the dead as proof of our salvation in you. We pray this, be with our pastor as we celebrate your resurrection. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, would you grab your Bibles and turn to John's Gospel, chapter 20. John chapter 20 as we get ready to kick off this morning's Resurrection Sunday message. Now, we got to do this for the guys listening on the, on the uh, CD, so you got to yell really loud, Christ is risen! He is risen! He is risen. Hey. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! Come on, get your Pentecostal <laughs> side going. Christ is risen! He is risen! And he, Oh, very good. That, that way we can put that on the radio so they'll hear us and uh, <laughs> let you know that uh, for those that want to watch later on YouTube, you'll be able to see that. But uh, I'm so grateful for what the Lord is doing and has done for us the greatest. This is truly the day we celebrate as Christendom, the day of Christ's resurrection. Some guys argue it's not this day exactly. You know, the, the calendars have shifted and all this. Guys, stop it. <laughs> like, Come on, man, just can't you celebrate what is good? I mean, this is the best day for Christian, the whole of all Christianity. The day we celebrate Christ's resurrection is the greatest day. Because this is the day he overcame death. And because of him overcoming death, we have the hope of everlasting life, eternal life granted to us because of what he did on the cross. And you know, some guys, they always get real petty uh, uh, little things in the scripture. And I, I kind of chuckle because I never believe there's any contradictions in the scripture. You know, they'll read Matthew's gospel and then maybe they'll be over here reading today what we're going to look at in John's. And they go, but it doesn't read exactly the same. I'm thinking, no, duh. It's two different guys telling the, the, how they saw that day. It doesn't matter. You get two different guys on any day Put them to see any, any given circumstance. Maybe they, they were both at the intersection by Queen K and, uh, and Polani, and there was an accident. One was over on one corner, the other one was on the, up by the firehouse side, and they both saw the same accident. But you know, I bet you if you interviewed them and you, and you asked them, how did it look to you? Their accounts could be completely different. Because one's looking from one side of the intersection, the other one's looking from the other side. I use this example often about, about you go to the zoo. You got two different fellows that are looking at the, at the elephant, and one is on one side of the cage, and he's going, he's got a big trunk and ears and a tusks, and the other one's going, no, that ain't what I saw. Big rump and little swishy tail and lots of flies. <laughs> now, I ask you, are they, are they describing the same thing? Yes, but from a different perspective. One standing at the face of the elephant, another one at the backside, and and yet, you know, some people say, "Well, that, that 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 you know, the Bible has that happening too." And I'm like, "Yeah," and aren't you glad? Because the part we're going to study today, the resurrection of Jesus, it doesn't just have one guy on one side of the pen and one on the other side. It's got like north, south, east, west. It's got all it got four gospel accounts. It's like having each point of the compass covered, and they're all described little different things that they saw from where they were standing. And I don't know about you, but to me, it, it kind of paints the picture more fuller. It, it like fills in the details. I mean, if you only had one guy's perspective, and he's going, oh, all I saw was the trunk and the, and the tusks, and the, you know, the tongue came out, and you'd be like, well, that's a cool thing. That, does all elephants look like that? Well, no, now you got to get on the side and see how they look. They're huge. You know, maybe you need another perspective to fill in the, the, the whole picture. And that's what we have in the Bible. When it comes to the resurrection of Jesus that we're celebrating, we have the blessed 
thing in the scriptures of four different gospel accounts telling us about this day. A day that was promised. Now, by the way, how many of you already have, have spent a little bit of time reading the Bible and learning about the day Jesus was crucified and then that led to him being laid in a tomb? What, what kind of tomb did they lay him in? It says very specifically, a garden tomb. He's laid in a garden tomb in a, that was hewn out of stone in which no one had ever laid. It was owned by a guy named Joseph of Arimathea, a very wealthy man. He let, he let Jesus, uh, well, he lent him his grave, really. He, was, he wasn't going to stay. Just, it was just a temporary loner for three days. But he puts him in there, and, and, and today we're going to see all of this stuff that takes place, him putting, being put in the grave, is all described by the different gospel writers. But there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. And I want to show you something maybe you, you students of the Bible may have already picked up on this, but, but some folks don't know this. And some of you... I want to, before I go any further, how many of you have been a Christian here at least five years? Would you raise your hand? Just want to see. I mean, you, you believed in the Lord at least five years of your life. Ten years, maybe? Any ten years? Fifteen? And I say, oh, man, we're going good. Going. Preaching in the car. Twenty? <laughs> oh, man, what am I doing up here? You come up here. You know? I mean, come on. We got people here that have been in the Lord a long time. Fifty. Fifty. Fifty years. Fifty blessed years. That is... So cool. I, I share at men's prayer, we had a fellow named Jake Bonds in our fellowship at Calvary Tri-City in Tempe, Arizona, and he got saved at, at, after 75 years of life. He was a, a woodworker from Holland. He went through the Great War. He had really rough times. And he, he used to, we'd say, guys, any praise reports to start off the prayer meeting? You know, anyone want to give thanks? And they'd all sit there sitting on their thumbs. I don't know what to say. I hope he doesn't call on me. And Jake would go, I got something. And we're like, what's that, Jake? He goes, I just thank God that Jesus died for me. And that I got to find out about that before I died. He goes, because I did 75 years without the Lord. And you know, his perspective, he, he was sharing this at 80. At men's prayer, it put us all to shame. It was like, he was like, and he'd look over at me, and I was a young man, that he'd go, you don't know how blessed you are. To, have, to know the Lord already at your age. I went through my whole life going through hard times, going through trials, and I didn't have the Lord to lean on. And it was stressful and it was hard and I felt lonely. You, you go through any hard trials, yea, you just said it, yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Those of us that have the Lord with us already, we, yet... Listen, is everyone going to have trials in this life? I mean, is anyone excluded? Is there any, ex I haven't found the exclusion clause. Everyone gets to go through trials, but the guys that have the Lord, they get to go through the trial with the Lord going with them. It's not like they're alone. They got, they got Jesus in the boat with them. Big storm, no problem. They were freaking out, by the way, his disciples were when they were in that big storm. Remember that story? What was Jesus doing? Sleeping. Oh, Lord, you don't care about us. We're perishing. Oh, you guys, stop it. Be still. And the, poof, the storm goes flat. Can you imagine? They're going, what kind of guy is this in the boat with us? That he even commands the sea and it obeys him. Now, what's the answer to that question? We studied it last week, by the way. The same guy who was able to sit on a donkey on which no one had ever ridden and ride it into Jerusalem with a bunch of people yelling and throwing palm fronds down and, and their coats on the street. And, and that donkey didn't buck him off. What, what kind of man was this? Well, we know because the scripture says he was Emmanuel, which translates what? God with us. You know, some of you, you've had people ask you, oh man, I wish... If God was real, he would just show himself. I wish he'd, you know, that he'd just come down here and let us know. And that's a good sentiment. If someone tells you that, don't go, oh, that's stupid. Just say, no, that's really good. But the answer is he already did. See, he already did in Jesus. God with us. Jesus, when he was born, the angels declared, this is, behold, this is a, this is a great day. God is going to be with you. 
Now, we saw last week, at the, at the end of the study, in, in John chapter 12, we were looking at Jesus riding into, the, into Jerusalem on that donkey. And if, if you'll recall this, it says, John points out something that's very interesting that you're going to have to hold on to for today's study. In, when John said this in chapter 12, he said right here, he said, these things, verse 16, his disciples did not understand at first. He had just ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey, and John says, we didn't really under, the, the disciples, he's in, talking about himself too. We didn't really get this when it happened. And I shared this last week, and so I just want you to pay attention today to kick off today's message. But when a certain event happened, then their eyes were opened to this particular goings-on, that whole donkey ride and the whole everyone yelling, Hosanna, save now. All of that came about right here. The light came on when? Look at verse 16 of John chapter 12. It came on when Jesus was glorified. And then they remembered these things were written of him. Until Jesus was glorified, they didn't get it. You know, until, by the way, if you have some friends and you're talking to them about Jesus and the things he did and they're going, I don't get it. Tell them, you haven't had the um, spiritual lens, the light turned on yet. You can't understand the stuff we're talking about until you, until you see today's message. Because today, we get to celebrate as Christendom the resurrection of our Lord from the dead. The triumph over death. And the sting of death in what Jesus did when he rises from the dead. Now, he dies for our sin as a sacrificial lamb just on what we call Good Friday. And by the way, that's the reason it's good. Because he died for me, a schmuck. Very grateful that he would die on my behalf and all of our sins he died for. And he gave himself as a perfect lamb. A sinless lamb. That lamb that would take away the sins of the world. Interesting though, John is the one that points out to us that they didn't actually get it. Not until later. By the way, sometimes you learn spiritual things and you, or you hear them, but you don't get them. And you're not going to get them until, until Christ helps you see him in his glorified state. Until you recognize him for, where does the Bible say he's seated now? He ascended and the heavens opened and, they, and he took a seat where? The right hand of the Father. As soon as you get that clue, by the way, that's him being glorified. He gets to sit at the right hand. It's a pretty glorious spot, don't you think, to sit? If you're at the right hand of the God, what does that mean? You're sitting in the seat of what? Of power. It's a, it's, a, it's a prestigious place to sit. Oh, by the way, do you guys remember when Jesus had, had um, a mother? Certain two fellows that hung out with Jesus, their mom, you know, being a good Jewish mom that she was. Some of you know who the two fellows are, right? Came to Jesus and said, um, could you do me a favor in your kingdom? Um, could you let my boys sit what? One on your right and one on your left. Who, who, who was that, Mom? Do you guys remember? James and John, that's right. The guy writing the, the gospel we're reading right now, his mom, good Jewish lady, is going, Jesus, could you do me a favor? Could you let one sit on your right and one? Now, why is she looking at, what, what, what is she getting at? She wants them to be seated where? In the positions of power next to the Lord. And Jesus said, you know, for me to, 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 to give that, that's not mine to give. Whose is it? Who's in charge of that, he said? The Father. But to drink of the cup that I'm about to drink, he says, because he was about to go to the cross, he said, they'll get to drink that. I guarantee that. They'll, they'll, they'll get to suffer like I'm going to suffer. And we do know that, that the, it wasn't really a great thing to be an apostle. You know, I always say, let's put ourselves in the story, but, you know, then I think, yeah, some of the parts of the story you read on, you're like, I don't know about that. They get beaten. Now, not in the scripture do we have this recorded. Josephus records that John, they tried to kill him. They couldn't kill him. Do you guys know how they tried to kill John, this guy that we're reading about? They boiled him in oil. But he wouldn't burn. 
They put him in a vat of boiling oil, and he's going, jacuzzi time. <laughs> the dude would not burn up, and they're just like, we don't get it. It was like, it, it was like remember when, when the, the fellows got thrown into the fiery furnace? And the king was looking in there going, how is it we threw three guys in and I see four? And the fourth guy is, and he said it. Do you remember what the king, Nebuchadnezzar, he is like the son of God with them. And I always joke about this because if I would have been one of those three fellas and the king yelled at me, hey, come on out of there. I would have said, come on in and get me. Because the Bible says they came out of that fiery furnace and not even the smell of smoke was upon them. The Lord protected them completely, just like he protected John. So they banished him to the island of Patmos because they couldn't kill the guy. Like, this, this guy's not going to die. And that's where he receives what we call the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation of Jesus. Same guy that authors the Gospel of John is the guy who God gives pens the last book of the Bible. But he says right here in his gospel, we didn't get this stuff when he was doing it in front of us. Because <laughs> some of you guys are going, well, if I was just there when Jesus did it, then I could believe. Then I'd get it. I got news for you. They didn't get it. What makes you think you would have got it? I'm just saying. They were right there. Right there. They watched him do this stuff. Did they get it? No. In fact, they're kind of blind to what's going on. And I'm going to show you one of the things I believe that caused their blindness. But before I do, let's go to the resurrection message, the best part. John chapter 20. Now the first day of the week, it says, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb. And while it was still dark, it, she saw the stone had already been rolled away from the tomb. And so she ran and came up to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved. And by the way, who's this other disciple? That's John. <laughs> At least he got one thing figured out. He was the disciple whom Jesus loved. By the way, could you say that about yourself? Are, are you the disciple whom he loves? Yeah. You know, God so loved the world, right? He gave his... We're all loved by God. But John knew it. And, they, and she ran up. She said, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb. and We don't know where they laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth. And they were going to the tomb. And the two of them were running together. And the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. That's an important fact to put in your gospel. <laughs> He's like, Peter might have walked on water, but I'm a faster runner. He could, win the, he could win that part of the triathlon, you know, in the water section, but not the running. I'm fast. I got there first. And stooping, he says, he looked in, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And slow and steady, Peter, he finally gets there. And he followed him, and, he, and when he gets there, he enters the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there. The face cloth, which had been on Christ's head, was not lying with the linen wrappings, but it was rolled or folded in place off by itself. So the other disciple, who had come first to the tomb, then he entered and he saw and believed. It's kind of funny that John is actually telling this about himself. But it also tells us a little bit about the rivalry that went on between these fellas. That he would actually have to say, I got there first. Now you think, no, not the apostles. They're holy. They're in stained glass. I mean, I grew up an Italian Roman Catholic. We had, we had the apostles, I'm not kidding, on stations of the cross in stained glass and, and, and beautiful mosaic pieces and in tile, little pieces of tile all broken and put together into a collage of beautiful picture remembering what they, what they learned from the Lord. And, and we go around to these things at, at, at this time of year and, and visit the stations of the cross, see what Christ, just a pictorial lesson of what Christ had done. And I, I don't know about you, but I always figured if they made it to stay, well, first of all, okay, just so you know, in the, in the St. Teresa's where I grew up going to church in, in Arizona, the, 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 the pictures I'm describing, they're, they're not down real low. They start up about this high. Uh, I'm sorry, I should be standing up. Six foot high. And then they go up 20 feet, 30 feet up, and they're 
They're wide, wider than a man's span of his hands. And so you got these huge, beautiful pictures, right? When you're a little kid, you're looking up at that thing, you're thinking, those guys must be holy. They made it to stained glass. I mean, they're way up there and they're shining and the light comes through. And, and I didn't think of these guys as ordinary men. It's kind of sad because that's not how the Bible depicts them. That's not even how John himself depicts himself. But it's kind of, you know how traditions are and men come up with stuff. And, and little kids, of course, our brains are not really figuring out the whole story. We're just like, like dudes in stained glass on the window. And he's way up there. He's, he floats. His feet don't even touch the ground. I, I used to think these guys must have been perfect. The, the, they were picked by Jesus, handpicked. The A-team. The apostles, right? They, they must be super holy or something. Except then you read the, the Holy Scriptures and it thinks on them. They were just men. And it, it proves they were just men. With all sorts of the same stuff men always do. You know, these fellas, they had it down. Je Jesus is trying to tell these guys, look guys, I'm going to go die. Now, this isn't new news. If you want to go all the way back to John chapter 2, same gospel we're in, go all the way back. So let me just show you real quick. One verse, you can highlight this one for today's sermon. John chapter 2. Jesus is with his disciples in the early ministry. And he goes in and the first Passover, after he did that, that miracle at the Cana of Galilee where he turned the water into what? To wine. He went up to the temple and these guys, they were, they were these money changers and these, they, they, were, they were profiteering off of people's desire to worship God. They come with their offering, you know, maybe they bring a lamb and they go, oh, let me see your lamb. Oh, that, that thing hasn't been expected by the high priest and, Look, it's got a little blemish. I'll tell you what, give me a couple of shekels in that lamb. We'll trade you up to a, a lamb that's already, see this ribbon? It's already been inspected. This one's allowed to go in. They had a racket going, by the way, the priest did. They would exchange it. Then the guy would take that lamb in and they'd grab another ribbon, put it on this one and say, okay, this one's ready. Next, next guy. When Jesus saw those guys doing that, and he saw them changing the money, the money changer saying, oh, you can't offer to God that Roman currency. That's not holy to the Lord. Bring it over here. Give me that Roman money. I'll give you the holy shekels, the, the temple shekel, and you can give that to God. And by the way, were they marking it up at all? You betcha. What was Jesus'... Is, how much did Jesus like? You guys know this, right? I hope this isn't new to you, but... Just so you know, Jesus didn't approve. He went in there and turned over the tables of the money changers. He made a whip of cords. He drove out these guys that were profiteering off. Of, I mean, he said, get out of here. This is my father's house. My father's house is to be a house of what? Prayer. And they asked him, what authority do you do these things? John chapter 2, verse 18. What sign do you show us that you are allowed to do this? And Jesus said, okay, you want a sign? You guys know this, right? What sign does he say to them? He says, I tell you what, you destroyed this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. They said, wait a minute, it took our, our fathers, our forefathers, 46 years to build this temple. And you're going to raise it up in three days? But look at verse 21. What temple was he talking about? His own body. He wasn't talking about the building. He was talking about this building, his body. You know, interestingly enough, in this scripture, our bodies are considered buildings, temples. Well, today, what does the Bible teach us our body is a temple for? As a Christian, the Holy Spirit, right? We, we are the temple for the Holy Ghost. God doesn't need a building. You're his building. And he made you... So he could send his building with his spirit in you to whatever assignment is need be. I mean, you're portable temples for his spirit. You, he goes, I need Greg, you over there. Go, you're going to help these people. They're in trouble. Send you in. Because he doesn't, you know, sometimes people aren't going to go to church to a building to meet God, but they need God to meet them. And so God goes, you, Go. And he sends you on assignment with his spirit inside you to help that person. Now, 
Jesus goes, he wasn't talking about that physical temple there in Jerusalem. He's talking about his body. From the beginning, he's telling them, look, guys, you tear this thing down, and in three days, I'll raise it up. This is from the beginning days of his ministry. He knew what was coming. The only reason I'm pointing this out is, how many years did he do his public ministry? I almost showed you, sorry. It's that habit being Italian. How many years did he do his public ministry? Right, three years. In the beginning of his ministry, he was telling them, you tear down this body of mine, this temple, and I'll raise it up. But John and Peter and all these guys, let me just show you something just to prove this. These guys, right before Christ dies, he has what's called the Last Supper. And in Jewish culture, it's a very significant meal. It was called the Passover meal, where they have the lamb that symbolizes that last meal that they would partake of in Egypt. Remember the Lord told them, get ready, I'm going to set you free. They're in Egypt. They were in bonds for over 400 years to Pharaoh. And God's people had multiplied, and God goes, I'm going to get you out of here. They're like, um, um, we, how are you going to do that? And the Lord said, I'll tell you what, go get a lamb. Slay it and take the blood and paint the blood with a, with a hyssop branch over the doorposts and the lintel of the house. You know, the, the opening to get into the house. Paint the blood of the lamb over that and then go inside. And take that lamb and, 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 and get it prepared and you eat the lamb. And you eat all of it, he says. If, you, if your family's too small to eat the whole lamb, you get another family. You get together. Have a potluck, so to speak. You know, get together, you guys. Get in there and eat the whole thing. Because this is your last meal before I set you free from the bondage of Pharaoh. And that night, we know what the Lord did, right? It says, the, the angel of the Lord visited Egypt. And every house, when he came to that house, if they didn't have that blood of the lamb over the doorpost and the lintel of the house. If they had the blood, what did the angel of death do? Passed over. That's where we get the name Passover. He passed over. Death passed over that house. Those people inside were okay. But if they didn't have the blood of the lamb covering their doorpost and lintel, what happened? The angel of death visited that house and the firstborn of the family members, of the animals, everything, firstborn, died. Read the scripture. It's pretty graphic. I mean, it's like, you know, the movie does a little, When I was a kid, they had Charlton Heston and Yul Brenner. Let my people go. No, no, let them, no, let them go. And then this green slimy mist goes through. You know, sp special effects back there wasn't... It still scared me as a kid. I was like, whoa. Right? And the firstborn die, and there's a big wailing. All right, go. Get out of here. He find, the straw that breaks Pharaoh's back is that Passover. The stronghold of the enemy and his power over us was broken by the Lamb of God. See, that whole story was a foretelling, a foreshadowing. The Jews love this. They call this a type or a shadow of a truth to come, that the Messiah would come and become the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And when you let Christ put his blood on, you know, we, we sing hymns like, What can wash away my sin? What's the answer? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. Right? That makes me what? White as snow. Thank you, Lord. I mean, we have the blood of the land. And some of you are like, don't talk about the blood. It's gory. It's distasteful. Oh, you're going to freak people out. Oh, shut up. Come on. I guess because I grew up on a farm, you know, blood is part of the whole, you got to do the thing, circle of life thing. You got to go out there and kill the chicken. You got to, you know, we ate, I'm sorry, if you're vegetarian, we ate chickens. We ate their eggs. I know some, I can't figure out because some vegetarians are like, well, I eat eggs, but not chicken. But a chicken is just an egg that sat around a little longer. I mean, when you grow up on a farm, you know these things, right? You just... Whatever. I don't want to get you to draw. I'll get hate mail over that and they'll miss the whole message about the resurrection just because they're thinking about chickens now. And blood. I want you to think about the blood of the lamb. 
The blood of Jesus washes away our sin. And because of his blood being shed, my, all of our sin has been covered. So that when that angel, of that, when the devil himself tries to get at you, no can do. He's got to pass over because you have his blood covering you. That's a very important thing in Christianity we need to hold on to. We can't let go of that. Now Jesus is telling them, you tear down this body, three days later I'll raise it up. From the beginning he told them this. <clears throat> At the Last Supper, he's sitting there with his disciples and he's telling them, guys, all this time up to this point he's been going, it's not yet my time, it's not yet my time, it's not yet my time. On this meal, what does he say? My time has come. Judas, go do what you got to do. The other disciples thought he was going to take the money bag and go out and buy something for the poor or something. What was Judas going to do? You guys know this because I got all these 50-year-old believers in Christ, 20, 30-year-old. You know what he did, right? He went out and betrayed the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. He said, I'll turn him over to you. Luke's gospel tells us this about that night, the Passover. Listen to this. They come together, and these fellas, this is uh, Luke 22 for those of my students out there trying to keep notes. Luke 22, verse 14. When the hour had come, Christ reclined at the table with his apostles. He said, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this, share it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And then when he had given thanks, he took some bread and broke it and he gave it to them and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in what? Remembrance of me. The same way he took the cup also. This cup is poured out for you. It is a new covenant in my what? Not grape juice, not wine, in my blood. He knew he was going to pour his blood out. But behold, the hand of the one that was betraying me is, is mine on the table. He says, for indeed the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he's betrayed. And they began to discuss amongst themselves which one might be doing this thing. And there arose a discussion. He said, and what did they start to talk about? <laughs> which one of them is the greatest? And he, he said to them, the king of the Gentiles lorded over them. And those who have authority over them, they're called benefactors. But it is not this way with you, but the one who is the greatest among you must become the youngest. And the leader must become the servant. Who, for who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? And then he taught them this lesson. But I am amongst you as one who, what? Serves. And what did he do? But, by the way, it's not said here. have to cheat and read one of the other guy's account, Matthew. While he was teaching this very thing about who's the greatest, they're all arguing which one's the greatest at the table. And the, Matthew tells us Jesus rose from the table. He girded himself with a towel. He got a basin of water. And he began to do what? You guys know, right? He began to wash the disciples' feet. They're all arguing. I'm the best. No, I'm greater. I'm the best. I should take over when he goes. No, I'm going to take over. I would never betray him. Who's betraying him anyway? And they're having a big discussion who's betraying him. You have to read the other gospel accounts to find out that Jesus takes a sop, a, a piece of the bread. He dips it in the, right into the, into the wine, and he gave it to who? Judas. See, because of the other gospel writers, I get to fill in some of the details that they're not all told here. Just John is focused on one thing here. And Luke here, in this part, he's focusing on what was going on, the banter at the table, the discussion. Now, John didn't mention this part. Hmm. Wonder why. Mr. Faster Runner. <laughs> I suspect he might have been in on the conversation of who's the greatest. And Peter, I think he was probably in on it too. 
Because Jesus got to his feet. We read about this in Mark's gospel. By the way, the gospel of Mark comes... Mark wasn't at the table, for those of you who don't know the scriptures. He's John Mark, young guy. But he would learn under which apostle? Peter. So if you ever wonder why it has so much insights that seem like they're Peter's, think about it. you got the Peter as your mentor, discipling you in the Lord, teaching you stuff. It would be pretty good, huh? Anyone volunteer to have Peter for your spiritual advisor? Mark's going, and um, they came to Peter... Jesus did, and he got the basin, and he was going to wash his feet. And Peter goes, oh, not me, Lord. Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, I have no part with you. Peter being so spiritual, okay, Lord, wash all of me then. <laughs> he goes, they that bathe, they don't need to have the whole bath again. They just need their feet washed. You, you just need to rinse it off from the stuff that touches this world. Peter. But I think that Peter and John and a few of the other fellows, they were blind to the big spiritual picture that Jesus was about to accomplish, that he was going to allow his temple to be torn down and that he was going to raise it up again three days later. And the reason that they didn't perceive it is because they're too busy thinking which one of them is the greatest. You know, it's funny how pride of man, not gals, gals don't have it, right? Oh, okay, we'll let you in the club too. Funny how all of our pride can be so blinding to spiritual truths. We get, we get absolutely get, and think about this. So how many friends or relatives have you tried to share with who they know it all already? You can't tell them anything. All right, I don't, read, I don't like that book, you know, because of what it says. I'm like, have you read it? No, but I'm just telling you. I always like those fellows. You know, they're going to tell me some criticism of the scripture, and you're like, have you ever read it? It comes down to it. They're like, no, I just heard it says this. I'm like, I got news for you. I know what it says. You know how come? Because I didn't just read it. I read it and read it and studied it and read it, and I got the privilege to teach it chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Every single verse of the Bible I have taught to this church took 15 years. And you know what I feel like? All right, now I can get started to learn what it says. For those fellows that think, wow, you really arrived. No, man, I'm just getting going. That's like a foundation. That's just like starting point one. I read it. I studied it. I taught it. And you know what's so funny? How many of you had this happen, especially in my 50 years in Christ here? Well, you read a passage, and you come back to it years later, and you read it, and you go, where did they put that in there? I didn't spot that the last time. And you know it hasn't changed because it's the same Bible you've been using. It's got all the same markings, all the same highlights. You're like, man, this is a new verse. <laughs> Snuck in. Isn't it weird how that, right, Adam? Amen? We have this thing that we just don't get to perceive the whole thing, even though we read it and study it and... And try to learn it. And you know, I believe sometimes we get blinded by our own pride. When the truth is right in front of our eyes, we just don't get it because, oh, we're too busy being great. Good thing he's got me on the team. Probably couldn't make it without me, God. Lord's going, yeah, right. But we get too full of ourselves. And these fellas, they're so full of themselves. They're missing the resurrection day, the temple being rebuilt. By the way, don't fear. Jesus will accommodate their foolishness. He shows up that very night in the room, risen from the dead, and says, hey, guys, it's me. Huh. They're like, it's a ghost. No, dude, I told you I'm going to rebuild it. See, it's me. Look, put your finger. Does a ghost touch me? And by the way, eight days later, because one fellow's missing, you guys remember which one it was? Thomas. He goes, I'm not going to believe. This is how much they trusted each other, by the way. <laughs> yeah, really tight club. All the rest of the guys go, we saw the Lord. He is risen. It was him. We stuck our finger in his hands. And, we, we, and, and, and well, do you guys remember the other gospel writer when Jesus said, it's, I'm not a ghost. Here, give me, you have something to eat? And he pulls the old... You know, if he was a ghost, 
Okay. You guys, how many saw Casper when, when you were little? The cartoon. Remember when he would eat something or try to put it in his mouth and poof, it would fall through him? Because he's a ghost. He's a spirit. Just no substance. He couldn't actually eat. It just... Jesus goes, you got something to eat? You ever wonder why that's in the Bible? He takes the fish. He eats it. Look, see, it's me. I'm risen. Stick your finger in there. And, they, and they're all... After the first day, they got to see him res resurrected. Except for Thomas wasn't in the room. And they're telling Thomas, we saw him, we saw him. Thomas is like, I don't believe you guys. Now you would think that the guys that walk with Jesus for three years would at least have a little trust amongst themselves, right? But I suggest to you that the idea of Christ's resurrection is so, so much beyond our human comprehension that it takes the eyes of our spiritual eyes to be opened. You know, we see that song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. Right? What, why do we need Him to open our eyes? So we can see Him. So we can, why do we ask Him, give us ears to hear? Jesus ended all the sermons. But those that have an ear to hear, let them what? Hear what the Spirit says. You know, you can have ears that hear audible words, but not hear God's Spirit. There's a lot of folks out there. They, I, I can be preaching, and literally, I've had this happen. Get done with the sermon, and Pastor someone goes, Pastor, you were on fire today. Man, that was right on. I, I, it was like you were speaking right to me. And the next person behind me, I didn't get a thing. <laughs> now, I only say this because I've actually had this happen. And I'm thinking, wait, it was, you were sitting like side by side. Isn't that weird how one person can be receiving from God what they need to strengthen their faith, and the person right next to them going, I'm not getting anything. I hope this preacher gets done quick. Doesn't he know this is Easter Sunday? We got a ham cooking at home. <laughs> by the way, that's an American thing because ham is kind of on the, well, it's pork, and pork is on the no-no list of, if you're a Jew, so. <laughs> and yet we had ham every yeah. Easter. Did, did anyone else have ham? Just show of hands. Just curious. Scallop potatoes and ham, right? I mean, we had that this morning. Yeah. <laughs> the breakfast we served, you know. I mean, sorry. If you're Jewish, you probably couldn't partake because, you know, it wasn't kosher. But it's funny how we... There's some people, their ear is really in tune to God's Spirit. They're like, man, I needed to hear that. Speak. They just want God to say, God, just tell me what I need for today. And I got a word for you, if you can receive, especially those of you who've been in Christ a while. You, some of you struggle with the friends and the loved ones that you have, that you're trying to share with them these spiritual truths, and you're wondering, why, why is it like you can talk to someone else in the Lord and they get it? And you have great fellowship about the, the, the spiritual things God's showing you. And then you tell the family member, and they're going, are you from Mars? Or what planet? I mean, they, they think you have lost it. You don't even know what you're talking about. And, and the reason that that happens, honestly, there's a reason. And that reason is simply that they have not yet get to see Christ glorified. Even John says, we didn't understand all that Jesus did. When he's doing that whole donkey ride, we didn't get it. Until he was glorified. And really, I think that's the, that is the real aha, light comes on moment for anybody to have any beginning of understanding of the things about God. Is It doesn't take place until... Until we get to see that that's who he is. Till we see he's the dude whose temple was torn down. And then three days later, he said, no man takes my life. I do what? I give it. I lay it down. But if I lay it down, he says, guess what? Now this is something he said that I can't say. Because he said, if I lay it down, I can what? Take it back up. Now either he's a quack and a crazy man and this is all far-fetched, garbage or as we just declared Christ is what risen he is what risen indeed see Christ is risen 
and he's now seated at the right hand of God. And the disciples 40 days later would see him with the heavens open right before them and the angels there watching as he ascends to go sit at the right. And guys, I, by the way, I take great comfort in this because, you know, some people act like heaven's way, way, way far away. You know, sometimes I think things of the Spirit are so close to us, but we're just not perceptive of it. We're just like blind to it. I mean, it's like a curtain has been drawn and we don't, all we see is what's on the curtain. But God goes, let me peel the curtain back. And by the way, when he died, what curtain got torn? The veil of the temple from the top to the bottom was rent. And it says in Hebrews, signifying that the way into God was now made open. We could, the thing that separated us from the Holy of Holies was now by God's, by God's sacrifice when Jesus was that lamb that died and he said, it is finished and he gave up his spirit and that great quake, that thunder and the curtain was torn. God made a way to get us into his presence. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father except through what? Through me. I'm the door. you got to come through me, he says. Now, some people get mad. Well, you're awful narrow-minded. I said, I didn't make it up. He's the one who said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. If you don't like it, take it up with him. Don't get mad at the guy giving the message. I'm just telling you what he said. You know, some people get really mad at the pastor. Yeah, you're so narrow-minded. You just preach Jesus is the only way. That's right. He is. Why are you so mad? At least you know that there, there is a way. See, it's the ones who don't really want to find out there's a way. They're the ones that get mad. The ones that are seeking. That's why I've shared this before, but because we're on the big island and a lot of folks were here, born and raised in a Buddhist upbringing, I always, I always first thing out of the gate, if I get to talk to someone raised Buddhist, I ask them, are you a true practicing Buddhist? You know, do you practice what Buddha taught, the principal teachings of Buddha? And by the way, most folks don't know the principal teachings of Buddha. But if you ask them, do you really practice? Are you a true Buddhist? Because if they're a true Buddhist, what was Buddha's principal teaching? He said, look at all of creation. You can't have all this design without a designer. Look at how the trees and the flower needs the bee and the bee pollinates a thing and then that and he's he was scientific actually i mean you think about i know he was a little heavy set but he was a thinker he he was he was he was observant of the intricacies and the interconnections in nature and he says you can't have all this design without a designer somebody had to design this if you got a designer and you know what Buddha chose to call the designer? God. So there must be a God that designed this. And if there's a God that designed this, then we should seek the way to God. That's the principal teaching of Buddhism. The, boil it down. You can talk to any Buddhist. Verify this if you don't believe me. Just find one of Buddhist friends. They're all around here. And say, tell me, did, is this true? Did Buddha teach this? That there's design in everything. If someone had to design it, he chose to call the designer God. And if there is a designer, then we should seek our way to the designer. Did Buddha ever say he was the way, by the way? Never. Yes, how do I know this? Because I studied Buddhism before I really got into Christianity. With my sensei, and you know what? I found out that it's interesting to me because the longer I, I got really deep in it, I realized, wait a minute, this dude was seeking the way. And then I learned one verse from John chapter 14 where Jesus said in verse 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And I go, well, why didn't Buddha become a Christian? <laughs> and by the way, if you know anything about chronological who came first, you'll know the answer to that. When did Buddha live? About 400 B.C. Round up, close enough, he said 500 Fourth century before Christ came to the earth. I believe if Buddha would have lived after Jesus came, he would have become a Christian. Because as soon as he would have heard the message that Jesus said, I am the way to the Creator, he would have gone, sign me up. The difference was he lived before, and yet he still had enough intelligence to recognize with all this stuff around us that's been designed, somebody had to make it. If somebody made it, we should seek how to get to that somebody. 
there was a stirring in him, a desire. A true Buddhist should have a desire, a hunger to know the way to God. And you, all you guys who raised your hand earlier have been Christian 10, 20, 30, 50 years. You already know this stuff. I'm preaching to the choir. You know that Jesus is the way. And you might have a Buddhist friend right next door who doesn't even know this. And all you got to do is say, hey, good news. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. He had his temple tore down and he picked it back up. And he said, I'm alive. Third day, here I am. Now, there's so much to this story, if time would permit. I mean, this is the privilege of getting to teach this every year. Last year, I got to share it from the perspective of Mary. Because she sat around the tomb waiting, wondering where did they take the body. By the way, did she believe he was resurrected? No. She thought his body had been stolen. Please, sir, just tell me where you've taken the body, and I will take it away myself, she said. She has so much love for the Lord. She's like, you know, you stole his body. I, it, look, I don't care what you, uh, just tell me where it is. I'll drag, I'll take care of it. And, and she supposed that she was talking to the gardener. Maybe she's crying, her mascara was running, she didn't see clearly. I don't know. But who was she talking to, by the way, there in the garden? Jesus. The resurrected Jesus. And all he had to do was say one word. Do you know what he said to her? Her name. Mary. She hopped to her feet, Rabboni. She grabbed onto him so tight. And by the way, you can go back to John's gospel, what we were studying when we first started. She doesn't want to let him go. <laughs> she, he's like, stop clinging to me. I haven't ascended to my father and to your father. You know? And she, he's alive. She runs and tells the, the disciples, he's alive, I've seen him alive, he's resurrected. They're like, she's cuckoo. <laughs> That's what they thought the first day. When Jesus shows up later that evening, he reproves them because they wouldn't believe the ladies who went to the tomb and saw it to be. Remember, the gals got there first. I always joke, if you want to get any news out, you know to tell first, right? The girls get there, the angel says, now Mark tells us, the angel go, is at the, at the doorway. Because remember, he's sitting up on the rock, that was stone, the ro huge stone rolled over the mount of the tomb. And Mark's gospel tells us that the ladies were going, who's going to roll the stone away? That was their concern. It's so heavy, how are we going to get in so we can prepare his body like it's supposed to be prepared? They're thinking he's still dead. Stone is rolled away. Mark tells us there was an angel sitting up on top. He says, women, why are you looking for the living amongst the what? The dead. He is not here. By the way, if you go to Israel and you visit the garden tomb, they actually had to put a wooden door over the opening. The stone is still rolled off to the side, but the, they put a wooden door there over the opening. And when you open it, it says right at the, from the gospel, Mark, it says he is not here. He is risen. And you know what? When you, it's so cool to be a Christian and travel from here in Hawaii all the way to Israel. It's a pretty long pilgrimage, about 27 hours on a plane and travel time with connections. And it's 12 hours difference from, from Hawaii to Israel. So like we look at a clock, what are we, 10-20-ish here? It is 10-20-ish at night. Just figured they're on the other side of the earth from us. And by the way, I take this as spiritually significant from my ministry because Jesus said he's going to tell his disciples, go into the world and make disciples of all men. And he tells them you start in Jerusalem, then Judea, Samaria. And then what's that last little bit? The remotest parts of the earth. Do you know that you are sitting on the remotest piece of land from any other pieces of land on the earth right now? And in Jewish thinking, you are sitting in the remotest because you're not only the remotest from any other continent, you are, from the Jewish mindset, completely on the other side of the world, 12 hours different. I get to be the dude that fulfills the remotest parts of the earth thing. I'm here to tell you the gospel came all the way around to the remotest part 
they tell you what Jesus did on that cross, and when they laid him in that grave, and then he pops out, and they just go, he ain't here. Go ahead, take a look. They go in, there's the, there's the wrappings, but where was the head cloth? It says, now pay attention to this, please, because some people are telling you about this thing called the Shroud of Turin, that this is the wrapping of Jesus, we can get the DNA off of it. Have any of you seen the picture of the Shroud? What does it look like? Does it have the head uh, piece folded and over to its side? No, it's all on connected to the whole mummy, right? It's all one big piece. It's a, it looks like a mummy, head to toe. And they say that that is the world, by the way, the worldly scholars say that that is the burial cloth of Jesus. I say baloney. And they say, why do you say that? Because I have eyewitnesses that were there the morning that he rose. And they went in. One was a little faster runner than the other. But Peter went in first, and there was the headpiece rolled up or folded in King James over by itself. It wasn't with the... Because you've seen the... Gosh, I don't know if you saw this. I, I'm watching the Learning Channel. Do not get your theology from the Learning Channel. I'm sorry, these jokers don't even crack the book open. There's no way they would have swallowed that garbage if they had just read the, the Holy Scriptures. They would know from eyewitnesses that the headpiece was folded by itself over to the side. So all that I imageography thing they did, the 3D recreation of Jesus' face from that mummy that they had there, sorry, it wasn't Jesus. Sorry, some of you go, oh man, I thought it was so cool because they kind of like, re you know, with computer-aided things and they recreated the 3D effect from scanning the... You know, we're so weird. We would want to worship an empty cloth instead of worshiping the one who overcame death and is resurrected. And if you're going to be looking at cloths that are wrapped up like mummies and try to make that the object of your faith. I'm sorry, you missed where he's seated. Your faith is misplaced. And don't be put in the shroud of Turin and those guys because that's not true. And Joseph's grave was just, well, he lent it to Jesus. And, and you know what I find interesting is that it remained empty to this day. The garden tomb is still there in place. In the garden. Now, being raised Italian Roman Catholic, I got to visit the Catholic site where they say he was laid. It's like this little brass thing on the floor with a hole down in it. And they say that's where he's laid down. I go, sorry. Where's the? I, I asked. I went to the Catholic site and said, as a "Young man, I'm not trying to cause any trouble. I was trained altar boy, speak Latin, had to learn it for catechism. You know, when I'm over there, I'm like, I just want to know." Where's the garden tomb? Where's the garden? In the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, they're like, um, well, uh, we just, we left that part out. You don't get to pick and choose and leave stuff out. Why is that stuff in there? To help your faith. To help you not misplace your faith. To help you put your faith in the resurrected one. And when you put your faith in Jesus, the resurrected Son of God, seated at the right hand of the Father, I tell you what, your spiritual eyes will get open. You'll be like, I get this story. Yeah, I get it. But the guy goes, I don't want to look at Jesus up there. <sighs> Sorry. When you're telling me all of your great insights, I'm, I'm just amazed at how blind you can be. It's not until we see him glorified that our eyes are open. The eyes of our, of our spirit that understand these things. The ears of our spirit that hear these things. That's the focus of all our faith. Christ resurrected. And it's a great thing to celebrate. I know guys are like, well, was it the three, three days, three nights? Was it, how do you get the three day, the three nights? Look, man, he said on the third day I'll rebuild it. He rebuilt it. What do you... I mean, I, and believe me, I have heard all sorts of arguments for the whole thing. You know, Jonah, three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man. Jesus did say that, by the way. Did he spend, well, what's it say in Ephesians? Before he ascended, he first what? Descended into the heart of the earth. Preach release to the captives. I'm going to end with this one favorite part of my whole thing of the resurrection. That I don't know why they don't put this in the movie, but it's right in the good book. 
Matthew 27. When Christ was there and he cried out with a loud voice and he yielded up his spirit in Matthew 27, 50, it says, Behold, the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. And then one of my favorite verses that I wish Mel Gibson would have put into his passion story. They didn't consult me, by the way, on that. You know, they, 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 but they did try to show the suffering in Jesus pretty, pretty good depiction. But verse 52, Matthew 27, 52, And the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were risen. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Have you seen that in the movie? Christ rises and then all these other saints that were waiting for the coming Messiah. They've been waiting there like Jesus described in Abraham's bosom. Why, why didn't they go to heaven yet after they died? Because the way was not, the door wasn't open yet. They had to wait. All of the believers before Christ came and made the sacrifice, they're like, I tell the kids, it's like when you go to the dentist, you know, and you got to sit in that waiting room until the lady comes to the door and says, okay, calls your name, and then you get to go in. You don't just get to go in to see him until, you get, until the door is open. Spiritually, until the Messiah came, the door was closed to get into heaven. The sacrifice had not yet been made. It was promised that it would be made. There was many people believed in that promise. They were waiting for the promise, but it hadn't happened yet. So before Jesus ascends, Ephesians tells us he first descends, preach release to the captives. Who wants to get out of here? Well, why didn't they put in this part of Matthew? I think this is pretty, pretty significant, don't you? Not only did Jesus rise from the dead, but the, the bodies of the dead saints that have been waiting pop up. And they're seen walking around you. Can you imagine your auntie died or your, your in Italian we say Nona, my, my, your grandmother died just a couple weeks before Jesus was crucified. And you're still mourning. You're having a bad day. Then you hear that this guy got crucified and he was an innocent man. And even, the, even Pilate didn't want to do it. He's washing his hands of the blood of this guy. And, and, and then there's startling news. There's some ladies running around saying, He's risen! He's not in the grave anymore. He's alive. And the guys ran and checked it out, and they didn't believe it. And then some went off on the road, and then Jesus joined them and told them, well, didn't the prophet say that the Messiah would suffer? Didn't it say he'd have to do this? Didn't it say he would rise again? And They're going, wow, that's a really good sermon this guy's given us walking with us. They didn't know who was walking with him, by the way, on the road. That's another whole Easter resurrection story. Who was walking with him anyway? Jesus. And when he came to the town, he acted like he'd go further. Oh, no, stay with us. Have supper. They still don't know who's, who, they're, who they're talking to. Gives great Bible studies. Takes the bread. He blesses it. He breaks it. And as soon as he does, what happens? Poof, he vanishes out of their sight. And they go, oh, the Lord is risen. <laughs> Duh. You know, I love that story because, I mean, if you ever felt like you don't always get it right away, you're in good company. The A-team didn't get it right away. They, 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 they were apostles. They, they ate apostles. They were not the sharpest crayolas in the box. But God still showed him who, who he was and who his son was. And that's good news. And when, why don't they put this in the story? Do you think this would be good touch? I, I got to get Mel Gibson to do like extras, yeah. you know, for the movie. And in the extra scenes, the, the, the part that, you know, they, they decided they had enough money after they filmed that they, they could go on and expand it. The extended cut version. We could throw in a few sub stories, you know, the grandmother who died a couple of weeks before and then she was a woman of faith waiting for the Messiah, but didn't get to see him come. And then Jesus shows up a couple of weeks later after they already buried grandma in the tombs over there off the hill of, you know, Mount of Olives maybe, and she's over there waiting for the promised Messiah. She's in, and Jesus dies, and he preaches release, and Grandma comes back. And she goes to the door. Knock, knock, knock. Hey, kids, open up. That sounds like, that sounds like Nona's voice. No, nah, it can't be. She's dead. And they open the door, and there she is. In her glorified, do you think this would make a nice touch for extended version? 
There she is, resurrected. Not just Jesus rose. This, this is why it blows my mind. Do you think this should be in the movie? That not just Christ rose, but he was the firstborn of the resurrection, and all those that died in faith got to rise too. I think this could warrant a pretty good extended version. We can make some seriously cool things. I mean, you see the people's faces when their loved one is back from the dead. Going, I'm home, dear. And, of course, Diana pointed out on Friday night, we were, we were talking about this at family night. Well, what happened to those folks? Did they have to die again? Or did they just ascend? You know, I mean, he ascended and did they get to ascend with it? We don't, see, it doesn't give that part. You think you got Bible questions. You can get behind me when we get there. I got a whole bunch on my list. I'll look stupid for you if you want. I mean, Lord, what happened to the fellows that ascended? Did they get to go with you at the beginning? Or when did they go up? Or did they have to live for many more years? Or did they get to live? I mean, what, were they in their glorified bodies? You know, anyone else have any questions besides me? You're thinking the same thing, right? You're going, and how was it when you were dead? You think they were asking Lazarus. I bet you they'd be asking all of those dead saints. So how was it? Right? I mean, come on. Would this like have been a faith-building time to be living in? I think so. But it's only faith-building because of one truth. Christ rose from the dead. And that's what we're celebrating today. He is risen. He's risen indeed. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your holy scriptures that have all these different accounts, Lord, that just fill in the story so fully for us of what you did to your son on this marvelous day that we, 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 we consider the day to celebrate and mark on our calendar in honor of you and your power to raise this wonderful gift, what you had given, the, the gift of your son, that perfect lamb, on our behalf. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. Thank you for giving your life that we could have life everlasting. And I pray if there be anyone that doesn't get it, well, they're in good company, Lord, but we pray that you would help them to get it. Help them to see your son for who he is and what he's done. Lord, open the eyes of their understanding. Let them see Jesus seated at your right hand by your Spirit's work in their lives. Lord, help us all Grow us in our faith as we go from here this day. We ask it in, in your son's precious name. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me let's sing a closing song and send you off in the joy of the Lord? Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.